it's nice that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, hi everybody. I hope we didn't advertise this talk being 10 minutes anywhere because it's double that and I couldn't cut it down because it was too tragic. I had too many things to say. So, um, thanks for a great turnout. And I was being so optimistic writing that into this talk before I even saw who turned up. <laughs> and, uh, um, okay, first off, to break down that oppressive dynamic of one person talking and everyone else listening a little bit, let's uh, have a show of hands in response to two questions I've been thinking about. Who here believes that the media is neutral? That's what I thought of. <laughs> <laughs> and who here believes the media can be useful? Yes, that's so. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right, Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Thanks. Are you talking about the mainstream media? Thanks. Thank you. Because the first <laughs> problem we can identify here is that when I say the media, most of us know what I mean. Um, because... In society we live in, as capitalism has created the society to be, there is only one media. No matter how many newspapers, TV channels, radio stations there are, there is only one media speaking for one system. So why don't we feel the need to qualify that statement more often, perhaps by saying the corporate media, mass media, as you just did, thank you. Because from what I can tell, we're still a long way away from creating a strong culture of creative, autonomous, outspoken, independent media as a viable alternative. And this has led to that pernicious tendency one sees far too often among activist communities, the tendency to work with what we have. And what we have is a sustained, relentless capitalist assault on our identities, our autonomy, our communities, our truth. I want to speak about the media in terms of what it does to oppressed peoples. I want to do this first in relation to the concept of media invisibility and how that translates into social invisibility. So, my first illustration of this is how many of us can remember the last time we met the eyes of a person begging on the street or spoke to them. When was the last time we met such a person with total openness, without judgments or preconceptions, basing our interactions with them only on what they tell us about themselves and how they interact with us? I mean, I think and I hope that for social justice activists that situation is very different than it is with most people. But I'm willing to bet that for most folks, privileged enough to have enough to eat and somewhere safe to sleep, Hi. The last time we did this would be a very long time ago, if it happened at all. And the fact is, if we ever look a homeless person in the eye, we don't see that person. We see a set of generalisations and assumptions that enable us to hurry away from that uncomfortable living, breathing reminder of how lucky we are. And what enables us to reject the knowledge being offered to us, the painful but potentially revolutionary consciousness that for far too many of us, the struggle against capitalism is not a fashion accessory, a weekend <coughs> hobby, an ideology to be toyed with and picked up and dropped, but a desperate daily struggle for survival. What enables us to perform that act of indifference that is nothing short of an act of violence, the act of simply walking away. What enables us to do this is those generalisations and assumptions which are clichés and caricatures sold to us by the media on behalf of the capitalist system. Does the capitalist system want us to think about the people it discards? The people who lost in its vicious game, the people who can't afford to pay for the right to exist? Of course it doesn't. And it relies on the media to rob us of the sense of community we have with these people and with each other. To remove the responsibility we have to connect with and help one another. And it does this by concealing the subjective experience of individuals within a homogenous category. So we don't see a person when we look at someone on the street who has lost their home or never had one. 
we see the homeless, a concept within which individuals disappear, a concept of which we are afraid. Our minds fill with the labels the media has sold to us to create within us the comfortable emotional distance on which the survival of capitalism depends. We think, for example, alcoholic, violent drug addict, and we hurry away from someone who may be hungry and scared and exploited. They must have done something wrong, we reassure ourselves. Because those of us who are good law-abiding citizens who work hard from nine to five and pay the rent on time and lead respectable lives are cared for by this wonderful society which offers everything anyone could want to those who have the money to pay. And so we are conveniently led away from the subversive conclusion that it is society that is wrong. Does the media tell us how it feels to sit on the pavement and be freezing cold and watch all these feet in expensive shoes moving past you, nearly stepping on you or tripping over you, and feel like you're invisible? Of course it doesn't. Why would it? In a system as ruthless as capitalism, there have to be casualties. They've calculated for it, like managers plan for shoplifting losses in shops. This pain is inevitable and irrelevant. And it is imperative that you, the passive consumer of media truth, believe this too. <coughs> I need hardly tell an audience of vegans about what the media does to our fellow animals. How far down any street can we walk without seeing a McDonald's advertisement, without seeing murdered flesh and the breast milk of violated and bereaved mothers offered for our consumption? Some of us may remember a time before we made the commitment to live as vegans when we responded to this media bombardment in a profoundly different way. Maybe there was a time for some of us when we looked at an advertisement featuring an exploited individual's corpse and we thought dinner. But for most of us now, that time probably seems very remote. And that remoteness lets us forget how rare and how alien to <coughs> most people a critical response to mass media is. Most people have no awareness of the individuals whose slavery and death they subsidise, the individual whom Carol Adams, author of Sexual Politics of Meat, among other things, everyone probably knows that, calls <coughs> the absent referent. In a bodily sense, pieces of them are everywhere, yet they have disappeared, and the violence has disappeared. The media presentation of these products of exploitation as food destroys the connection that would enable us to feel the empathy we naturally would feel. This brings us to the crucial role media plays in alienating us, both from the violent oppression of those all around us and from our own oppression. Media turns us all into an audience, and thus ensures our passivity in the face of an endless litany of capitalist atrocities. We rely on the media both to create and reinforce our identities, we are distanced from our own experiences and become spectators sitting in front of the TV screen of our own lives. The media creates a set of categories into which we disappear, eagerly submerging our individuality in our quest to define ourselves against each other and reassure ourselves we actually exist. <coughs> and that is how the media can sell rebellion to us. Because what we miss is the carefully hidden fact that our existence as the embodiment of stereotypes, whether middle class business person or punk, is a form of disappearance. We let the images of life define how we feel life should look. When things happen to us, we turn to the media to define what we have just seen or heard and how we should feel. When we meet people, we refer subconsciously to our media conditioning in order to recognise and relate to them. We watch and listen as we are misrepresented to ourselves, as the media saturates our environment and reinforces the violent status quo which we must all buy into, or the media tacitly threatens, disappear. So, where was that? Yes, and the real disappearance and silencing, which the system's ubiquitous mind control disguises as representing us and giving us a voice, goes on all around us in every area of our lives. It manifests itself in many subtle ways, and many not so subtle ways. To me, as a woman and radical feminist, it is glaringly obvious how the media is used to control, devalue, oppress and silence women. With issues as varied and vitally important as the sensationalisation of violence against women, 
the perpetuation of the harmful fantasy of the nuclear family as a protective and nurturing environment, and the reinforcement of repressive, socially constructed gender roles. There is no time here to explore everything. So I'll make a few brief observations to illustrate what I mean. When newspaper headlines scream society's disbelief and incomprehension, on the rare occasion a rape makes the headlines at all, this construction of what happened as an aberration for which patriarchal society has no responsibility denies the lived experience of all the women who live with this appalling violence or the threat of it every single day. When, on a much more subtle level, a TV advertisement shows women cooking meals while the men sit at the table waiting to be served, this is an attack on all the women who are questioning and challenging male dominance in every area of their lives. A destructive aspect of media representation of women, which feminist author Naomi Wolf explores in some detail, is patriarchal standards of so-called beauty. <coughs> This came home to me with terrible clarity a few days ago when I saw a magazine cover <coughs> featuring photographs of female celebrities beneath the headline, Best and Worst Bodies. This is how totally real women have disappeared from the media, and thus from our own consciousness. The assault on us in this male-dominated context is very real. Women are wounded emotionally by the airbrushed images they could never resemble closely enough and wounded physically all too often by the eating disorders to which these emotional injuries lead. The portrayal of women's bodies and women's perspectives in the media bears as little relation to us and our realities as the history of feminism does when it's written by men, as it all too often is. When I saw that magazine cover, I thought of a woman I was in hospital with who had come close to dying of anorexia. I thought how this woman might walk past that shop and see that magazine as I had done, in the first fragile stage of her recovery. And I felt so angry thinking how that example of destructive, twisted, patriarchal ideology could kill her. I'm not exaggerating. Another example of the hidden violence of the media's version of truth, though it illustrates what we have, to a certain extent, constructed as another form of oppression, is the portrayal of folks labelled by society as disabled. These people are marginalised through either absence from the media or patronising depictions of them as bravely combating their afflictions in order to become as normal as possible. Or else they are stigmatised by portrayals of vicious killers as being disabled, thus constructing difference from social norms as something to be hated and feared as potentially violent. An example of this is that I saw a report of a mass shooting at a school being talked about on a discussion forum. And one of the first things that was mentioned by the mass media about the shooter was that he was autistic. The media report did not openly blame his actions on his autism, but it didn't have to. The agenda behind the prominence of this detail was perfectly clear. Difference, the media suggests, is something to be feared, not accepted, celebrated or understood. So probably become obvious to everyone by now that I hate the media. Two things then that bewilder and sadden me are our failure as a movement to embrace the revolutionary possibilities of independent media for the purposes of activist organisation and community building, and our continuing willingness, indeed in many cases desperation, to engage with corporate media. <coughs> in the light of everything I've just been talking about, this phenomenon is pretty much incomprehensible to me. How valuable and how truthful and consistent can our message ever be, printed alongside fast food advertisements, consumer luxuries and sexist objectification? If our truth is consumed by the reader or viewer alongside all this garbage, what will that context do except confuse and neutralise it? So let's think for a moment about the odds stacked against us. The media is not a view from nowhere, a just, disinterested reteller of objective truth. Such a view, divorced from the subjectivity of the reporter, is not even possible. Who, then, are the media? It was the Frankfurt School and particularly Marcuse who made the first determined efforts to formulate a critical theory of mass media which highlighted its important role 
in pacifying those whom the system defined as a potentially revolutionary mob by creating false consciousness. And those who thought I couldn't get through an entire talk without mentioning Mark User have just been proved right. They understood, this is the Frankfurt School, how the media is used to strengthen the dominant paradigm by feeding us an ideology and moral code that is in line with the status quo, along with an image of that status quo as natural, inevitable, and even desirable. From the reinforcing of narrow stereotype gender roles to the violent commodification of women that is pornography, from the conversion of non-human animals whose worth is the amount of cash they make for their enslavers into disposable, consumable objects, to the casual but systematic validation of norms against which people of differing races, abilities and sexual orientations, as only some examples, are measured, the media sells us authority and conventionality. Control of the mass media is increasingly concentrated in the hands of governments, advertisers and privileged elites. Do we expect these people to be free of class or economic interest? Do we expect idealistic journalists who have a real commitment to telling the truth to survive in this profit-driven environment where nothing is sacred except money and the state? <coughs> and I've reminded myself at this point to um, digress slightly because um, what I was just speaking about reminded me how media is one institution of social control and another is religion, organised religion. And uh, the link between these two, I was reminded of it because one of the books I was looking at while I um, prepared to give this talk was a sociology book. And in that book, um, was a feature on legal restrictions of the media and one of the legal restrictions was blasphemy laws and this law forbade um, reviling, scurrilous and ludicrous references to God, Jesus Christ or the church. So I must admit that as an atheist who regards organised religion as reviling, scurrilous and ludicrous, this one made me laugh quite a lot but the mentality it reveals is no laughing matter. Um, on the contrary, it's yet another manifestation of what I'm talking about. The fact that media, media absorbs and mirrors back to us oppressive society. Media, as an agent of capitalism, survives by painting state violence in terms of peacekeeping and national pride and demonising the defensive violence of those who fight back against it as terrorism. <coughs> And when proof of the rottenness of the system does leak out, it is hastily portrayed by the media as an exception to the rule. What saddens me with regard to this particular phenomenon is the willingness of animal advocates to buy into it. For instance, demonising individuals already painted by the media as excessively cruel. Quote marks. Thus taking the focus off our deeply speciesist society and reinforcing the idea of brutality as somehow separate or separable from exploitation, rather than routine. To all those of my fellow activists who still believe that mass media is capable of reform, or has anything at all to offer us, I say, why do we want any contact at all with such an odious institution? It only seems as though there is no alternative because we have failed to create revolutionary communication channels of our own. And this is where <coughs> Many amazing anarchists and radical feminists have succeeded. The zines, the pirate radio broadcasts and the underground documentaries that come from these traditions of uncompromising resistance have so much to teach us. And the philosophy of practical idealism which they represent is our hope. The voices of independent media are nothing like the homogenous, deadening indoctrination we are faced with every time we turn on the TV. They are as varied and revolutionary as the people with stories to tell who dare to tell them. They are disruptive, outrageous, unafraid, uncensored and truthful. They are the opposite of mass media's passivity. And that's an essential quality of mass media which I've also reminded myself to digress about because it made me think of being in hospital. And one room we had in the hospital was called the activity room. And what you got when you went to the activity room was an empty room with a TV. 
and that's an activity. And I think that pretty much counts as a perfect illustration of how media takes away all our agency from our own lives and then gives us back this plastic alternative to it. So passivity is what that made me think of. Because everyone I was in hospital with, there were desperate fights over the TV remotes and magazines that people hadn't read yet, because that had become what life was, you know, a representation of life, which is a tragedy. So yes, that is what anarchists and radical feminists are rebelling against, and that's their tradition. And it is to this tradition and the utopian future it promises that I want my life and my activism and my voice to be faithful. I want no part of a state-controlled institution that does what it has done to my fellow animals, my fellow women, my fellow activists. My rejection of mass media is an act of solidarity with every silenced and diminished woman, every objectified animal of every species, every compassionate person who was labelled as a terrorist because they fought for a better world. And it is also an act of solidarity with my own truth. I'm not interested in the marginalised and censored representation the system is offering to me. What I don't understand is this version of the media as giving us a voice. We have voices already. And it is the media that is silencing them. No voice speaking for oppressed peoples is as valuable or as true as those people's own voices speaking for themselves. Do we recognise our voices when we see the caricatures we've become in mass media? Or do we look for ourselves in vain? My argument here is that we won't disappear, which is what we're so afraid of, I feel, if we reject mass media. We will appear for the first time, as we really are and can be, as a community of revolutionaries. I would rather speak directly to one person than have my words twisted and used against me and against those whom I fight in front of an audience of a million people. And that's why I'm here speaking to you, because speaking to people and listening to people is revolutionary. And it's vital for the cause of total liberation that we're all fighting for, that we remember and practice these skills without which no revolution can survive. And that, in the face of the onslaught of capitalist lies and propaganda, we refuse to forget them. So, thanks for listening.